Good morning. Well, welcome our visitors. I see we have a few, and uh, we hope that if you have any questions about anything you've seen us this morning or any Bible questions, that you feel comfortable enough to ask, ask any of us or myself in particular, and we'd love to do our best to give you an answer that comes from the Scriptures. And that's what we're going to do this morning is, is try to search the Scriptures for some answers. Now, it can be tempting to look at racism from a historical perspective and see that, well, slavery was abolished at the Civil War, and then, you know, we had the Civil Rights Movement, and then and that took care of some of the integration problems, and so those problems are solved and taken care of in America, and, and that's kind of something in our past. Yet, when you look at the news, you get a different, a different story. It seems every couple of weeks or every month or so, like in Charlottesville, Virginia, recently, most recently, I should say, there's a story that comes come about violence or two groups protesting and, and resorting to violence and a lot of anger and, and a lot of hate that still exists today in America. And that tells us that this isn't really just a problem of our past in America, but it's something that's still going on right now, problems or issues that we face in this country. As Christians, I think it's incumbent on us to, to lay example and to have some answers for what's wrong with society today, in particular, the question about racial tension or racial issues. I haven't spoken on this subject ever before, um, and there's a couple reasons I'll mention, but what has encouraged me, what has challenged me to speak on this subject is, for one, you can't ignore it when it's in the news and some of those things that are going on, and it's all over social media, people have um, an opinion about everything, and this is something you hear a lot about on Facebook. But also, uh, a few months ago, I saw a video. It was a, it was a Bible conversation. It was four preachers, two of them black, two of them white, and it, and it was a conversation, a biblical conversation about racial issues, and that really encouraged me. And in fact, towards the end of this, it's about an hour and 20-minute video, the Church of Christ at Dowlin Road in Beaumont, Texas. They have a great website, they produce great videos, a uh, great source for learning more, more about the Bible. They produced this, and it was uh, uh, two or three of their own preachers and a guest preacher from Birmingham, Alabama, and it was just a great, a great hour and 20 minute long video. Uh, these men of different racial backgrounds and a variety of ages, so they covered different perspectives historically, and just giving some of their insight uh, from the Bible uh, on what's going on in America today and what's happened historically. And it was very eye-opening and enlightening for me. But towards the end of this, they challenged, what are some solutions to the racial problem in America? And they said, well, more preachers, preachers talk about this from the pulpit. So those preachers that are watching tonight, I hope they'll take these scriptures and they'll study them and then they'll share them uh, wherever they're at. And that was taken by me as a challenge. Now, I haven't spoken on this for a couple of reasons. For one, I've been in Utah for the last eight years, and you look around, and this is a very white state. I'll just be very frank. Uh, going, going to census.gov, as a matter of fact, Utah is in the ballpark of 90% or more white by population. And you might look at that and think, well, it's not really a big, as big a deal here as it is like in Birmingham, Alabama, or Atlanta, Georgia, where, you know, there's a lot more tension and it's a lot more, um, you know, equal mixtures of different races. But the more I thought about that, the more I realized maybe the fact that we're so predominantly white, maybe that's all the more reason why we do need to talk about this here. Because those in the minority are even more in the minority than they are in other places in the country. And I'll share one brief experience. Uh, earlier this year, I went on vacation in Miami, and I was with the family and Jessica's family, and we went to get you know vacation and breakfast at McDonald's. And I was the first one to walk in, and first time in my life, I was the only white person in a building. I'm not saying I was frightened or anything, but I will say that was, that was something I never experienced. I had an acute awareness that I was the only one that looked like me in that entire building. Now, imagine... That's every building you walk into just about, every day of the year. That's, that's kind of the, the feeling that someone who's a minority in Utah would have because they are so much in the minority as compared to other places. I think perhaps to suggest, rather than not needing to talk about racism, 
we need to talk about it more because I think we need a, a greater sensitivity to this because of how skewed the demographics are in this state. And, and the second reason why I've never really addressed this in a sermon is because personally, I'm very ignorant on this subject. I think a lot of that has to do with growing up in the Northwest. You know, they, they've, got, they've got some issues up there, but uh, I'll say one of my favorite things about the Northwest is how diverse the population is. I had a lot of friends. I didn't just have white friends. I had a lot of friends of a lot of different backgrounds. Um, <clears throat> some of them who were born in other countries and their par parents moved them when they were very little to America. And so I didn't really you know, experience it in the sense of what you see in the South today. And so I didn't really understand it. And I still feel like I don't really understand it. I've been working on this sermon for a long, long time. I kind of put it on the shelf so I could talk to some of my friends that have experienced racism or could maybe educate me a little bit more. And I think I've learned some things, but I also came to the realization that I'm naive about a lot of things. I'm ignorant about a lot of things in this world, but that's not really the point. It's not really a matter of how much does Kyle Goodwin know. It, it's about what does God have to say about it in the scriptures. So this isn't really a matter of me being an expert on this subject. It's a matter of I've got the revelation of God here in my hands, and I've studied it and continue to study it, and here's what I've observed from what God has said about this subject. So just because I'm maybe naive or ignorant on this subject doesn't mean I can't have something to say about it because I'm just going to do my best to share God's, God's perspective. So that's my, my two little caveats. So that, that being said, I'm going to do what I was challenged to do by, by those couple of preachers and, and try to do my best to share a godly and biblical perspective on racism and, and perhaps give us a few ideas we can take away at the end of this lesson. Uh, first thing I want to point out is this is not a new problem. This is, this is not a new issue. Obviously, as I've already mentioned, we could go back to the Civil Rights Movement in the 50s and 60s, go back uh, many generations before that to the Civil War and see institutional slavery in America. But we could go beyond just American history and find other examples all throughout history of slavery. And in fact, we'll notice in the scriptures there's examples of racism and prejudice all throughout the Bible as well. But it's not just a matter of not a new issue. It's also not something just isolated to America. We need to understand this. This is not an American problem. It is a problem in America, but it's, it's all over the world. I had a very close friend in middle school who was Chinese. Um, I believe her parents were born there and immigrated. I, I, I don't remember if she was born there or born in America, but you know, her, you know, her grandmother, I don't think, spoke a word of English. And she told me, I really can't date anybody who's Japanese because my grandmother would not allow that. She would really have a problem with that. She would, she would be furious if I brought home a, Ch a Japanese boy. And I know for most white people, we're probably thinking, well, Asian is Asian, right? And no, um, different countries, different backgrounds, different histories. Uh, they have their own tension there, and, and there's a history there between China and Japan, Japan that has produced some issues there. And so you go to countries in the world, and you see that this is not just an American problem, and it's not just a 21st century problem either. Now, when we go to defining racism in, in Webster's Dictionary, it's uh, a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Uh, some people try to more precisely define racism as one thing or another. I kind of like how broad this is, but it points out that racism is the idea that we're judging based on the outside, that we're making a determination that your value is based, based on your race or your appearance or your skin color. And this can include a lot of things from, like I mentioned in American history, institutionalized slavery, uh, segregation, uh, and, and even what still exists today is the idea that the system is, is kind of against minorities, that it's not necessarily institutionalized slavery like leading up to the Civil War. War still, there's a pretty good argument that the system, the politics, the way things are, is, is kind of geared towards favoring those who are in the majority racially. It can be other things as well, since, such as bias, 
prejudice, or even things of a less insidious nature, like insensitivity. Sometimes we just say things that we don't really realize might have a different meaning or, or somebody in a way we didn't really anticipate. And so it kind of covers a broad spectrum of things. But when I think about racism, what it boils down to is making a judgment, judgment on value or character based upon their race or their skin color. And from a biblical perspective, that's simply not fair, and that's simply not okay. Now, in John chapter 4, I just want to point out that this is something that is addressed in the Bible, and we do see this historically, and the Bible points this out. In John chapter 4, there was a lot of prejudice between, between the people and the Samaritans, or any Gentile for that matter. John chapter 4, I'm going to start in verse 6. This is where Jesus visits the well. And, and meets the woman there. Uh, it says in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw, to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan? And here we get this little parenthetical thought, um, like, like an addition. It's, it's to help for those who are reading John's gospel, like us today, or people who might not really understand the animosity between Jew and Samaritan. John helps us out. He says here in verse 9, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. This is just one example, but this is prevalent throughout. We're going to look at some other examples where Jew and Gentile had a difficult time meshing together and, and working with, with each other and being one in Christ, but this was definitely a, an issue in the first century, just like it is in the 21st century. It was to the point where Jewish people might even wash themselves after going through a Samaritan or Gentile city just in case they brushed up against one. You see, there's a great degree of prejudice there that existed in Bible times, yet just because we see that it took place in Bible times and the Bible mentions it, it does not mean the Bible is endorsing racial prejudice or racism. I think the Bible is plainly outspoken against racism. It's simply not okay. Galatians chapter 3. This scripture was read for us uh, before the lesson started. And this one, I don't know, it speaks very plainly that in Christ we are all equal. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If we are all equal heirs of Christ, if it says we are all one and we are all equal in Christ, then how could we possibly treat someone with inequality? That simply does not fit it's not consistent with what the Bible teaches to treat someone with inequality, to treat them as less than your equal because of their appearance, because of their race or gender will add to that. But racism is simply not okay from a biblical perspective. First Timothy chapter one, I want to add this as well. This is something it's a blink and you'll miss it reference, partly because of the way it's translated. But in first Timothy chapter one, it says the law was made for sinners. You know, it's, it's made to condemn people and point out sin. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else contrary to sound doctrine or sound teaching. Kidnappers. What does that make you think of? Part of this is the way it's translated, but that word really has at its core the idea of taking someone away, stealing someone away with the intent of selling them as a slave. The ESV actually says enslavers. So I think that's a great verse to point out that this is simply not something that's okay. It's not a new issue. It existed in Bible times, but the Bible does address it. That's just a little bit of scratching the surface, but we're going to dig a little bit deeper in the scriptures as we go further. Now, one thing I want to point out, though, is it's okay to acknowledge that we have differences. Each one of us is unique. Each one of us is different from the next. 
We might fit into larger groups or cultures or subcultures or races, but at the end of the day, it's okay to acknowledge that we are different. There are, there are a lot of factors that make up my personality, that make up my identity, who I am. Race is one of those. Race is one of our identifying characteristics, and it's okay to acknowledge that. I think it's well-intended, but I think misguided when some people say we should be colorblind. Well-intentioned, because I like the ideas my, I'm going to get to in my next point. We, we need to be on the surface and, and acknowledge what really matters is the soul, the heart, the part of us that's created in the image of God. So I, I think it's well-intentioned, and I understand the point of saying we're colorblind and I don't want to see race, but at the end of the day, okay to acknowledge what makes you you or what makes someone else them. Now, in this video I was describing, this discussion on, on racial issues, one of the black, black priests, the, uh, he was a little bit older, and he shared an experience. He said that watching um, Warren Moon be inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame made him tear up. He said, and as a Cowboys fan, Troy Aikman was also inducted, but he didn't tear, tear up for Troy Aikman. He said, Warren Moon was special to me because growing up, you heard that, you know, black people weren't smart enough to play the position of quarterback in football, and they, re they really, you know, that was kind of above their abilities, and to see Warren, Warren Moon, black man, accomplish that and, and accomplish a great degree of success to be enshrined in the Hall of Fame in, in the NFL, it, it sent a message to him that and this preacher, he also went, went to college and became a lawyer. And he said, that was another one of those walls that I was able to break through. That's, that's where I kind of looked up to Warren Moon as he kind of broke through a stereotype. And, and so he went to law school and became a law lawyer. So said a lot of that has to do with, with men like Warren Moon who were able to break, break through the stereotypes and, and show that, that they can do anything anybody else can if they put their minds to it. And so, you know, and his point was, you might not have shed a tear for Warren Moon. It might, might not have been that important to you, and that's fine but it was to me. And so it's okay to acknowledge that you and I are different. It's okay that to acknowledge that because of your race or your family or your culture, the country, country you're into, you're going to have a different appearance from me. You're going to have different tastes in music or food or hairstyles or clothing, and that's perfectly fine. It's okay to be you, and it's okay to be different. Diversity and ethnicity sh should be celebrated. That's great, and it's okay. I get the well-intentioned idea of being colorblind, but to look at someone of a different race and say, I don't see you as, as black, or I don't see you as, as Japanese, I just see you, you know, you're kind of under, undermining a big part of their identity and saying, I, you know, I don't acknowledge that. And it's okay to acknowledge that. And we see that in the Bible, too. Um, when we have the early converts, first converts to Christ were Jewish. But then in Acts chapter, chapter 2, you start to get some Gentile converts. You start to get some who weren't Jewish people coming into Christ. They didn't go through Judaism into Christ or Christianity. They just came straight in there from in Greek or Gentile or whatever nation. And you, you see that they retained some of those distinctive characteristics. And that was okay. In the, in the Bible, it was okay. A Jewish person who became a, a Christian, they had always grown up. Thinking, you know, when you're a child, when you have a boy, a boy, you need to circumcise him on the eighth day. And when they became Christian, they probably still did that for the most part. Because they were used to doing that. Doing that was okay. And the Bible never says, just because you're a Christian, you have to stop doing that. A Jewish person, you know, they were used to observing certain days, celebrating certain days. And they probably still, still did. A Jewish person was, you know, accustomed to not eating unclean foods. And now in Christ, there's nothing that is unclean. They can really eat anything they want but their conscience would still bother them. And so, you know, in the epistles, it's, it's told to them, if your conscience, conscience bothers you, then, then don't eat that food. And so they still culturally probably retained a lot of their Jewish characteristics. The same thing with Greeks. The, the who became Christians, they probably retained a lot of their cultural characteristics. And the Bible says that was okay. The problems happen when you started to impose this on somebody else. In Acts chapter 15, uh, we see this was a big, big problem, so much so that, that all the apostles and some of the elders and a lot of, uh, a lot of Christians gathered together in Jerusalem to say, let's, let's talk about this. This is a big problem. Acts chapter, chapter 15 and verse 1, uh, it says here that some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
it was all right, right for to still be Jewish and still have some of those cultural identifiers. But then to go and say, you have to change and become like us, that's where it became the problem in the Bible. Same thing in Galatians chapter 2, you know, where, where Peter, Peter was the first to preach the gospel to Gentiles, the first to baptize a Gentile. And then even in Galatians 2, certain people came down and started to influence Peter. And we'll read that verse a little bit later. But Peter started to withdraw himself from Gentiles and start to, start to behave like a Jew who is prejudiced again. And that was a problem that Paul had to confront Peter about. And so he was, he was imposing his Jewish culture on other Gentile Christians. And that's where the Bible says that's not okay. So one simple point is it's okay to acknowledge our differences. From a biblical perspective, it's okay to be, to be you, to retain some of your cultural identity. It's okay for you to, to, to have, you know, certain ideas or customs as long as they're consistent with the laws of Christ. And it's okay for me to be me and, and, and appear the way I appear. And, and so it's okay to acknowledge these differences as long as we're not trying to judge other people or condemn other people or force people to conform to our ideals or cultural identities. That's where the problems come in. So it's okay, it's okay to acknowledge that we are different from each other. But I think the Bible emphasizes our similarities. It's okay to acknowledge we have some differences, but those, we have to admit, are on the surface. That is a big part of our identity, but if we're in Christ, that is our identity. Above all else. It's Christ in me. And so... <clears throat> Though we may be different from one another in a number of different ways, it's what we all have in common that should unite us. In Acts chapter 17, Paul makes this profound statement. Acts chapter 17 and in verse 26. This is what he says to those in Athens. He said, He made from one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. This points us, of course, back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 1, verse 26, it says that God created man in his own image and in his likeness. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, Eve got her name because she was the mother of all living. Trace it back far enough, we all have the same mother. But on a much more significant level, spiritually, we might look different. We might have some different customs, speak different languages or different vocabularies. But what we have in common outweighs what separates us. It matters so much more than those things that make us different. It's the fact that within each and every one of us, God breathed into us life, and we bear his image spiritually. We are all created in his likeness. And that's what should matter above anything and everything else, is the fact that we all are created in God's image. <coughs> Though in the Old Testament we see that Israel was to retain a certain separateness from the other nations, it's always been God's plan, and this is the direction it's always been moving towards, to have people of all nations united together. That's always been God's plan, and it's always been moving towards that end, towards unity. In Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, you know, we often think with starting with those people that are nearest to us, those people in our neighborhoods, but maybe we're missing the point when he says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All nations, go across borders, go to everybody, go to anybody, not just those people that are like you or nearest to you, but take the gospel to all nations. In the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 7, we, uh, we studied this recently on Wednesday night. This is a, a heaven's perspective of the ascension of Christ when he, when he left the earth in Acts chapter 1 to sit on his throne. This is heaven's perspective. As he sits on his throne and receives his kingdom, it says in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 14, to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. 
Christ's kingdom was meant to encompass the whole world, to be open for everybody, that everybody could be united. Revelation chapter 7. We get a New Testament example here, this great uh, depiction of, of beyond this world. What we see in Christ's kingdom is that everybody is united in serving him. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, After these things I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This has always been God's intention. That though we retain some uniqueness, he wants us to understand that that all of that is is secondary to what we share in common. A common spiritual heritage, a common spiritual goal, a common spiritual identity in Christ. That all nations, all languages, all tribes are welcome to come together and be as one. I want to finish... I know this might not be, I don't expect that in 30 minutes, you know, I'm going to say everything that's going to fix every problem with racism in America and, and, you know, by the end of the week. But, and I don't know, this is probably just a part of the solution, but I, I feel like I need to offer something tangible, something you can take away for you. you. I don't know, the solution could include something bigger, bigger, activism, grouping together, but I, getting into political issues, I don't think that's something... An answer to that, that question should come from a, a preacher in the pulpit. Those questions on activism and things like that, that comes down to you in a personal decision. But I think as Christians, as disciples of Christ, I think there are some takeaways from, from the bond, how we can personally make a difference in the people we encounter in this life. Um, let me just say, first of all, we're look, looking for more than just tolerance or acceptance. I, I, always, I always cringe when people talk about racial tolerance. Yeah, I can't stand them, but I, I tolerate being in the same room as them. And, you know, we're going for something more than that, that. We're going for something deeper than just tolerating or accepting other people. We want to learn about them. We want to develop bonds and relationships with them. We want to bridge the gaps between us. Let me go back to one more Old Testament scripture here. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Let me go back to one more Old Testament prophecy that describes what God God tended. This is God's plan for his kingdom, for his people. Isaiah chapter 11. I'm going to start in verse 6. It says, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the the lord will lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. And the nursing child will will play the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Lord, waters cover the sea. Let that verse, verse 9, let that sink in. This is how God's people should be characterized. The rest of the world has, I don't know if the rest of the world will solve these issues. Like I said, we go back thousands of years of easy racial problems and slavery and, and, and bias and prejudice. I don't know that the world is going to come to a solution on this, but within the body of Christ, within his kingdom, they, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Hurting others, tearing others down for such petty reasons as skin color. That should not exist among God's people. Christ died to break down that racial barrier, to break down those walls that divide us. Ephesians chapter 2, if we want to honor Christ's sacrifice, and put our life, our life for Christ and sacrifice our lives for him. If we want to honor his sacrifice, we are not going to divide ourselves over these issues. Ephesians 2 and verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of command, man maintained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it, having put to death the enmity. 
He is our peace. And he's speaking primarily of, of Jew and Gentile, but to kind of come full circle with this discussion of Jew and Gentile, that's why Jesus died. He died to tear down that wall, to become peace, to make the two into one new man in his image, in Christ. Peace must become our objective. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, let's go ahead one more chapter, start in verse 1. Before I make some specific observations uh, about what we can do as Christians, let me just point out that peace, I called it an objective, and maybe that's not the right phrase. Peace isn't something we necessarily obtain and then it's ours. I think peace is something we have to constantly work to maintain. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Showing forbearance. Other translations say bearing with one another in love. That might mean putting up one another a little bit overlooking some offenses a little bit, but I like what it says in verse 3. We must be diligent to preserve. Peace isn't something we have and then it's ours for good. Peace is something we have to constantly work to maintain and hold on to. So with this verse in mind, with that as our objective, that there is no hurt, there is no damaging within the body of Christ, that is not our characteristic, that we must work for peace, honor Christ's sacrifice for unity. Let me offer just a few suggestions what we can do personally. I don't know about fixing, you know, nationwide, but I can say as a Christian, my light needs to shine extra bright on this subject. And prayer. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, we're told to pray on behalf of all men everywhere, especially for leaders. This sounds like an obvious suggestion, but it needs to be said. Prayer is not the Christian's last resort. It's not a, well, nothing else has worked, so I'll try it. Prayer is the first thing Christians do. And so I want to ask you honestly. It's easy to write something. It's easy to rant something on Facebook. That, and I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm not saying do or don't do that. But I'm, I'm asking you, are you doing something about it spiritually? Are you praying? Have you prayed? When you see something disturbing in the news is your first reaction to pray, to go to God in prayer and ask for changed hearts and, and, and comfort for those in, in suffering or, or those who are, you know, misunderstanding, those who have, have a, a sinful perspective, that treat others with evil, that their hearts would be softened through whatever circumstances possible to soften them and open them up to the truth of God's word, that they would love others instead of hating others. Do you pray for the hearts of other people? Do you pray for those who are suffering, for those who are hurt? Do you pray for those who are doing the hurting? We don't overcome evil with evil. We overcome evil with good. I'm not saying you can't call all some evil evil. By all means. When something's evil, you call it what it is. But don't forget, we need to love everybody and pray for everybody. So prayer is first on my list for a reason. It's not a last-ditch effort. Prayer is the first thing Christians do with a crisis. Uh, secondly, let me suggest you go out of your comfort zone. Go to Acts chapter 10. I mentioned before that Peter was the first to baptize, to teach the gospel to a Gentile. And it, this took Peter very far out of his comfort zone. And that's what it's going to take. If, if you want to know how can, in my life, how can, how can this be improved... Go to your comfort zone. Um, Acts chapter 10, I'm going to skim through some parts and read other sections, but the first eight verses, we have this, this man, Cornelius, a Gentile, a very good man doing his best to find God. And, and Jesus promised us, if you ask, if you seek, if you knock, you'll find God. He's not trying to hide from you. If you look for him, you'll find him. So here's a man that's searching, and he finds this, the truth. He says, go and send for a man named Simon or Peter. So in verse 9, uh, on the next day, they're on their way to go get Peter, and uh, Peter has a dream. In verse 10, it says, he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance, and he beheld the sky opened up, 
and a certain object like a great sheet coming down lowered four corners in the ground, and there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals, crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again a voice came to him a second time, God is cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times for repetition. Peter is still not getting it. And by the way, I'm not excusing bad, bad behavior. I'm not excusing racial prejudice, but we need to be patient with people because, I mean, look at Peter. It, you know, God tells him three times. Each time, I think, getting a little more obvious. And he doesn't get it. Um, now, verse 17, now while Peter was greatly perplexed as to what this vision meant, he, he was confused by this. And he goes and, and you know, to Cornel Cornelius' house and starts teaching him the gospel because he was sent there. And he still doesn't quite get it, but he's going to go along with it. And it takes the Holy Spirit of God being poured down from heaven upon these Gentiles to get the message. Yet, just a, a few years later in Galatians 2, he's already discriminating against Gentiles again. It has to be... So just, just wanted to point out with Peter and look at his life and how he, you know, tried to overcome prejudice, prejudice life. It wasn't an easy task for him. So that's where patience comes in. But again, getting back to Peter's story and getting out of his comfort zone, he goes. After seeing this, this vision, these men show up and say, look, we were sent here by this man Cornelius. Come and teach. And, and, and so Peter arose and went and, you know, he arrives there and Cornelius tells him, you know, I had a vision that said to send for you. And Peter said, I had a vision that I think I, I understand this now. I think I get it now. Uh, verse 34, and opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And so he goes on to preach to him the gospel and um, how he's a witness and apostle of Christ. And as he's speaking these things, the, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon him. And um, verse, verse 5, and all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speak with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter and Peter, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Now let that last verse sink in a little bit. How far out, far out of comfort zone has he gone now? He's gone into the home of a Gentile and he says, normally... We don't have interactions with Gentiles. You know, this isn't normal for a Jew to be in the home of a Gentile. But then beyond that, they say, can you stay here for a couple of days? It's a good thing Peter did. Look at all the good that came from this. He comes back to Jerusalem and uh, verse 2, when he comes back to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him and said, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. And now he's in trouble for it. This was not an easy thing for Peter. Not only did he go out of his comfort zone, he entered their home. And, and by the way, what I mean by going out of your comfort zone, go and talk to people of a different race. Invite them into your home. There's something about being in your home, eating with them. In Galatians 2, that's what Peter stopped doing. He refused to eat with Gentiles. There's, there's something about eating a meal with somebody that, that opens up the dialogue and warms up that relationship. So that's what I mean by get out of your comfort zone. Talk to people. Try to put yourself in their shoes. If you can, I, I, I don't think you can sometimes. So that's where you need to listen and, and hear what they have to say and hear their story and open up your home and be open and listen and talk and communicate. Go out of your comfort zone. You might, might not be used to that, but things aren't going to improve unless you, you start doing things you haven't done before. That's part of this solution. Uh, and I'll, I'll just throw in one other suggestion there too is try to try to maybe learn another language or if you took a like Spanish in high school try to dredge up some of that Spanish and relearn learn it learn another language because you know I've heard a lot of people say if you come to America you better learn our language and uh, there may be some truth to that but honestly try to put yourself in the position of someone who felt they needed to leave to leave their country and go somewhere unfamiliar because of the better opportunities that's a risk they're taking. It's a challenge. And honestly, this is a way where Americans have failed. There's kind of a joke in the international world. Someone who speaks two languages is bilingual. Someone who speaks three languages is, tri is tribal. Someone who speaks one language is American. 
That's part of going out of your comfort zone. Learn a little bit about other people and about their customs and cultures and respect that. But open up your, your life to other people and go out of your way to make those relationships. Uh, one thing I'll say, too, is speak up. When it comes to solving racial issues, again, I said earlier, some people might turn to activism, activism together in large groups. And like I said, that's, that's, that's a decision for you to make. I don't want to make any comments on that from the pulpit. But as an individual Christian, you have an opportunity to confront racism, prejudice, do it. Stand up for what's right. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, this is the example where Peter, who should have known better, is the first one to you know, baptize a Gentile. Um, <clears throat> verse 11, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11, but when Cephas, that's the apostle Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? I appreciate Paul's boldness here. He saw something that was wrong. They're not being straightforward about the gospel. They are misrepresenting Christ. And I'm going to call them on it. I'm not necessarily saying this has to be a shouting match. It certainly doesn't have to be insults or vulgar language. But, And this is especially true for those who would be racially in the majority. When you see something, when you hear something that is not right, that is not consistent with the idea that in Christ we're all equals, call that person on it. Speak up. Speak up for what's true, what's right, what is good. You know, Paul would say to the Romans that, that we need to respect what is right in the sight of all men. And so we need to stand up for what's right. So I think speak up, not just speaking out against, but also speaking means dialogue. Don't be afraid to talk about this. Just simply talking about this can help um, move the dialogue in a productive direction. But I think before we speak, we first need to listen, and that's James chapter 1. Be slow to speak, but quick to hear. This is one where, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm very ignorant on this subject. So I really shouldn't impose my opinion too strongly. This is one of those areas where I need to do a little more listening than speaking. I need to understand that people might face challenges that I have not. And I need to hear them and support them and acknowledge some people have struggled. Some people with their different perspective, uh, different upbringing, different cultural background, different race might have faced different challenges than I have. So I need to learn to listen. And one final thought, be patient. You know, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2, um, it says we need to be patient with one another and forbearing with one another, um, showing forbearance with gentleness, with humility, with patience. These are all characteristics we need. Humility, because I might be saying something that is offensive to somebody. I don't even know it. I need to be humble enough that when somebody confronts me on it and says, hey, you might not realize this, but that, that's hurtful to somebody else. I need to be humble enough to say, I didn't intend it as wrong, but if it is hurting someone, I'll let it go. I can change. I need to be humble. I need to be patient, too, and assume the best. Maybe somebody says something racially insensitive. Assume that they didn't mean it. Maybe talk to them about it and say, hey, did you realize this? But, but don't assume malicious intention right away, and be patient. Like I said with Peter, it, he struggled with this. And many Jewish Christians did throughout the first century. Um, so patience is, is needed as well. Proverbs chapter 9, 9 verse 11. I'll finish with this one. Uh, I, I've used this a lot in less recently. It's kind of a scripture I've been contemplating very heavily. Uh, Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 11. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. We do not overcome evil by evil. We need patience, we need humility, we need love, we need forbearance. 
But more than anything, we need God. So I just want to leave that as the final thought, that we look to God. We acknowledge we're different in a lot of ways from one another, different experiences and whatnot. But at the end of the day, we are all created in the image of God. And we need to treat everybody with love, with respect, with dignity. Period. I don't know if that's going to fix the entire entire country, but I sure hope that when people encounter a true disciple of Christ, they will walk away better for that experience and that interaction, that they will not be experiencing hurt or hate or prejudice or racism. The truth is, Jesus died to save everybody. The Great Commission was to go to all nations. And that commission is, is that, that promise is still true today. And if there's anyone here this morning who needs the blood of Christ, he died for everybody. That's you, that's me, that's everybody in the entire world that they could have their sins washed away. If you're in need of that grace or if you need prayers, need encouragement, need help to understand the Bible, whatever need you have, please come forward now as we stand and sing.